said, Bob, you want to grow or you want to breathe? So we kind of talked through it. I can't remember what state I was driving through, but we talked for quite a while. Okay? He said, I really want to breathe. Okay? Steve was just talking. They both live in South Carolina. Steve says, I don't know about the breathing part. That's pretty complicated. Okay? So he says, I, he decides he doesn't want to breathe, but he will grow birds out to 16 weeks. So he could say, Bob, but next year, I want to do a trial. I want to raise 250 of your bar in Plymouth Rocks. To, so Bob hatches them. Steve never has to deal with breeders, never has to deal with hatching. Doesn't have to invest in infrastructure, no incubators or anything. He hatches the chicks the day they hatch. Okay, as soon as he sets the eggs, he says, Steve, your eggs are due on you know, September the 6th. So Steve bumps the, the breeder. The day they hatch, get them out of here, you know, because if you've got 250 here, 250 here, he's like, I can't house your chicks for seven days, and then you, on the day they hatch, you come get them. This is kind of some principles from the industry that actually work really, really well, okay? So Steve says, Bob, you hatch my birds, I'll come and get them when they hatch, okay? He only raises them for 16 weeks. They develop a relationship working together, and, uh, Bob says, hey, at 12 weeks, he goes to take a look at the bar in Plymouth Rocks, and he goes, ooh, I really want that male. And he helps him and does some assessing. Hopefully, he's learning from me, or Bob and I make over to his house together. Okay? He may say, hey, can I buy that male back? It's kind of be a mutual uh, agreement that Bob can say, Steve, you know. And, and Steve understands the networking, and so he's like, that's a good male. Take him back home. Now they can figure out some kind of compensation, whatever that looks like. Okay. Take it off my next door. Take it off my next door, whatever. <laughs> okay. So then Steve raises these birds for 16 weeks. Boom, he's done. Four months. He tried 250. Now he may say that was a success or that was a failure. Hopefully it wasn't a failure, but if we're working together, hopefully there'll be some things that they can learn together. Okay? So Here's how it could look. Anybody else from South Carolina? That's right. And so, Bob, what's the name of your farm? I forget. Long range. Long range. Long range farm? Long oh, branch. Branch, that's right. I'm sorry. Okay? You might want to put this if you need a visual. He becomes the parent farm. Okay? The daughter out here is Steve. Steve says, I'm going to just up the ante. Steve says, I'll raise, let me go ahead and do a thousand of Bard Plymouth rocks. Pam says, I don't want to breed either. But Bob, I'll raise 500. Okay, Pam's out here. This is farmer number one. I just don't want to touch them. What's that? I just don't want to pick them up. <laughs> Bob's well, probably not interested in having you as a daughter farm. All right. <laughs> farm three, farm four. Here's what can happen. Steve buys these 1,000 Plymouth Rocks. Let's just say, and I don't think this is probably true, but Steve's not a marketing guy. Steve's like, I like staying on my farm. I love to raise the birds. That's my favorite chicken. Um, so Bob says, you raise 1,000 birds. And by the way, Steve, I want you to use this feed from this and, and there's an agreement there. It's kind of like we're working together here. And Bob says, Steve, I will, every chicken that is alive, I will buy it back because Bob already has 24,000 of them sold. Okay, so he may buy them back. Or they may go to Steve and Steve says, I already have my market. I have a CSA and I've got connections and I'm good to go. So he sells, if a thousand birds go to Steve, Bob never sees them again. But there could be where you can also do where um, you all four farms work together. You may say. Pam, Pam may do the marketing. You know, they may go from That's where I'm Bob to me to Pam or whatever. Absolutely. Absolutely. These four farms can be because there's those who market, those who breed, those who grow, and you can really work together. This creates, this is what excites me, a regional sustainable movement with poultry. And you are not dependent upon anybody else outside of your area. 
and that, that's really exciting. Now, east of Eden Farms in Huntersville, North Carolina, uh, Jonathan Boston, he's raising about 2,000, I think he's got about 2,000 Buckeyes in the farm right now. You need to look at his website. And actually, it's connected to the Sustainable Poultry Network. You go down below, you'll see our, his farm. Take a look at it. Jonathan at East of Eden, he had Pat Weaver, who's our number one certified flock of Buckeyes. I think Pat hatched around seven or 800 birds for him. Okay? Jonathan said, you know, Jim, I want to grow them and market them like Pam and Steve. But I really feel like I need to learn the art of breeding because that's what makes it sustainable. So he's kind of learning how to breed. He's in his late, uh, how old are they, Melissa? Late 30s? I mean, late 20s, early 30s? Yeah. Jonathan and his wife left the farm in the Piedmont, said, we're done with the farm. And then they went to Atlanta, lived on the high life, and did the old, you know, and said, wait a minute, let's go back to the farm. So, and they're doing a great job. And he's planning on working by the East of Eden Farms. And you can see his website. He's a, he's a Buckeye guy. So they're, and we're learning from that. Actually, Jonathan's like, you know, we're, we're dealing with issues. And, and like hens, he wants a four pound bird. And the hens are dressing out at three pounds. I need a bigger bird than that. He's doing a no soy and uh, non GMO feed. He sells the Buckeyes for $7 a pound. Okay? Actually, his market, he, he is a, um, he is a social networking maniac, selling birds. Yeah. I'll tell you something else. Go ahead. Is it live weight? No, this is processed. How many $7 is Processed bird. So if he's selling a four pound bird, it's about $28 a bowl. Um, well, I think I have, let me give you, let's talk, I just gave you the mother-daughter farm model. Let's go through this budget item and, and Can I ask so, a quick question while you're on $7 a pound? Yeah. So, so retailer than that. Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, Does it matter? Same price, what you're selling to the person or Yeah, let me come back to that in this marketing piece, okay? You guys are sending me down rabbit trails and I'm just like, okay. no, that's fine, that's fine, that's what you're supposed to do. My job to keep this. So, because I went, I'm way off the content. So, Budget items to consider. Approximate direct costs to the bird. Chicks and poles. If you get breeding stock, I already said four to eight dollars on a chick. Okay? To begin with. Now you gotta also keep this in mind. Jennifer invested in chicks at eight dollars a piece for her offscores last year. She also, this year, I sold chicks for her and she sold chicks. Okay, now I'm not sure she wants to reveal it, but you could ask her to say, how do you do on chick sales? You can check in with some of our other farmers. One thing that helps is everywhere I go across the country, I say, they say, I want birds from one of your certified flocks. I create some of those sales for you. We also try and do it by state. So when I'm teaching in South Carolina, I say, you go to Buff, for the one of this breed or that breed, in North Carolina, Tennessee, or wherever. Okay, and you're in West Virginia. Right. So, feed. Non-organic, uh, double the price for organic. Usually it's about 50% higher, so in your decision-making process. Chickens will eat about $7 per bird, $7 of feed in 16 weeks. That's the That's correct. That's correct. Yep, and if you want to double that, it'll, it'll eat about $14 worth of feed in 16 weeks. Each chicken. Turkeys, 120 pounds of feed per fit per bird through about 28 weeks. Turkeys, a heritage turkey will put on four pounds of feed, excuse me, it'll eat four pounds of feed and put on one pound of meat. On a heritage bird. Okay, labor's in it. Well, bulk feed about $100 a ton. 
versus six or four hundred dollars a ton versus six hundred dollars a ton. That's for non-organic feed. It's about what you'll what you'll pay if you buy it in bulk. Okay. Usually it's a ton. Uh, Rocco, where's our feed at? Right there, right outside. Oh, okay. You can see those are one-ton totes. One-ton totes. You've got to keep this in mind. The most, one of the most labor-intensive things is bagging 50 pounds clothing. Bagging clothing. The more bulk you can get, the cheaper it's going to go. Our one-ton, make sure you're sitting down, to have that delivered from Reedy Fork feet to here is $1,000 a tote for a ton. It's a long way. Uh, and the delivery is 85 bucks. But they, yeah, absolutely. And they actually deliver here. They deliver a bunch of people. So we're, we get on the schedule. I'll ask another one question. I understand feeds are uh, chickens. Do you have to feed turkeys? Meaning, uh, bag feed. Can they not be grass fed turkeys? No. No, they, they. Much like you do. Why? Yeah, they're still a domestic bird. Yeah. Uh, so you can't raise them like you raise a grass, grass fed beef cow or a wild turkey? No. You have to put feed up. That's, if you want to make money and you lay it on your birds, you better feed them. Sure not yeah, make small birds without feed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very small. <laughs> Good question. That's a great so question. So how old are those turkeys out there? I'm just trying to compare the size of what I see on my farm. How old are those? Oh, those, those turkeys birds? are almost, uh, well, sorry Cam, sorry. I tried to trying to ask the sun to go somewhere else. For we can let this table out. Uh, so, Pam, those birds now are if not double the size of a wild bird. It's getting close. They're, they're about, if you can catch them, May, June, July, August, September, they're about 20, 18 to 20 weeks old. They got eight weeks ago. That's correct. Labor is your next plan. And all I'm going to say on labor, how will you determine this? I'll tell you what. I know a lot of farmers who say, oh, farmers don't get paid. You don't? And I, a lot of guys who are working with in the network say, how can you, you can't make, if you can't make a living on it, you can't get paid for your labor, then why are we doing this? So figure out your wage. Are you worth $3 or $15 an hour or 25 bucks an hour? Put that in. Most of our guys, Jonathan, uh, Gary Sykes, you guys, you know, we're, we're saying let's figure this out so you aren't losing money on this. Okay. Indirect cows. Housing ranged from 400 to 2500 That's from a V-dub to a Cadillac. You kind of figure it out. Some of you would rather have the V-dub. Fencing, chargers. Waters, feeders, nesting boxes. This is the indirect cost. Turn the page. If you decide to do on-farm processing, these are average prices. The plucker is about fifteen hundred. The scalder is about four hundred. Stainless steel tables. If you find them, you might hit a jackpot and find them used for about a hundred bucks. If you go to Sears and buy a couple of deep freezes, they're about six hundred bucks a piece. Your miscellaneous tools, whatever that is, killing cones, about sixty bucks a piece. Labels for bags, uh, processing area, the structure will vary in price, deciding on whether you're going to use a tent, if you're going to, Jonathan built a, uh, well actually you guys have a great structure too, uh, at their farm they have an actual building, and they took this equipment and installed it in a, in a shed. Um, it's about the size of this building, half, half the width, but about this long, they put, they do all their processing. It'd be great for you to go up if you're, you know, ever just wandering around the hills or something like that and go to see these guys. Right. So I'm going to figure that $12 would be okay, $5 for chickens at all farm process. Say it again. With a blank that says something all farm. Oh, I'm sorry. Processing off farm. That's a very, very important figure. On the average, you're going to pay about $12 a turkey to have somebody else kill it for you off your farm. And on the average, a five dollars chicken. Okay. Now, if you go back, this ties into this other necessities on farm: knives, long removers, the coolers, crates, ice machine, shade uh, for tents if you got weather. Here's the key note, right there, that blank. 
we pretty much have figured out that if you do a thousand birds or less in a year, you cannot process these off farm and make any money. It won't happen. So if you're like, we're going to do a thousand birds, or we're going to do 999 birds, do it on your farm if you're thinking of making any money at all. Now, you, you do know, actually, a little more freedom in North Carolina than South Carolina. We are in this, this state here is very, very empowering. This thousand birds that you, or less that you process on your farm in North Carolina can be sold to anyone. Consumers, restaurants, farmers markets across the board. Now, it's a little stricter in the South, right? Okay. And quite frankly, as we gain farmers there, a lot of my time right now is fighting and working with legislation and saying, why are you not honoring the federal? This is a federal exemption. We're fighting in Montana and fighting in California, and I'm often on the phone with the State Department of Agriculture and kind of trying to fight for the farmers. Because if you guys, you know, in South Carolina, you go, I can't really, why well, waste my time? They keep shutting me down. There's no inspection or anything like that. Zero inspection. You could be doing it on your tailgate with a bell pocket. Well, I will tell you, and we have a very good working with Right. You do have, we encourage our farm, there are some very basic guidelines, like a meat handler's license from the state of North Carolina, it costs five dollars. Uh, and we work very closely. We want, I tell all our farmers, we work with the state regulations and federal. So if you want to be a man, federal, federal regulations are very low. Yeah, yeah. The other exemption is 20,000. So in North Carolina, you can process 20,000 or less, and your exemption, you do a little bit more of an inspection, but not much. And they all have to be birds you grew, and you cannot use them to process them. You can't use them. You cannot use you, have, you can have your own like open air processing, like you could buy your own feather and set up, but it cannot be used to anybody else. Oh, right, right, right. Right. And all the birds of that 20,000 have to be raised on your farm. That's it. Well, that's true of the 1,000, too. 1,000 or 20,000 have to be birds that are grown. You can't, Kevin can't say, hey, guys, everyone who did under 1,000, bring your birds over to my farm. That's actually illegal in the state of North Carolina. Okay? But I'll tell you this. In North Carolina, and the, the state, our relationship with the state is very, very good. And so when they say, when you say we work with the Carolina Heritage Poultry Coalition or the national movement, they go, oh, we know what, what you're about. We have a great working relationship with them. Very, very excited. And um, so, get sidetracked. Thousand birds or less. We also recommend that you process at least 200 birds in one setting to be profitable. So at Western Piedmont, if they have more, if they can do 200, when she's, well, she's getting all the students together, so she's at an advantage with some free labor. But, for Todd, he's like, we don't set everything up and do 10 birds. I mean, they might, but ideally, you know, if you're going to set it up and you might hire some people to help you do some processing, um, Gary Sykes, president of the Carolina Heritage Poultry Coalition, he says, we're learning more and more, we need a minimum of 200 birds. And we do have, we do, Gary does have a mobile unit um, that he can take to your place. It's certified by the state, and he can come, and there's other units like that in Indian, South Carolina. Still fighting. Still fighting. Good. Well, I'm going to join with you and we'll keep fighting. So other possible expenses, egg coolers, ice machines, uh, brooding room, incubators, hatchers, uh, seed equipment for foraging, insurance. Uh, some of our farmers in North Carolina are insured. Uh, it's not required with, with the exemptions, but it is encouraged. Your chef may say, what if you sell me a bird? And I, somebody gets salmonella from one of my chickens that I got from you, then one of us is going under. So, might be a good idea to get you. Okay. Business planning, we provide the coaching. I already kind of did breeder growers, egg production. Uh, any questions about that? It looks to me like you're paid by your chickens. And you should be, I think it's 
sense from the, uh, the repercussions, you know what I mean? So like if they buy it and they're accepting the knowledge that, hey, this means to be bad or sick chicken or whatever the case may be. Probably if you really came down to it, that's what it would be. But there is your relationship with that. Yeah. I'm going to be into this marketing piece. Let me just give these 10 real quick secrets to marketing culture products. Number one, define your mission. Mission of the Center for Polk, well, let me just put it this way in my paraphrase instead of reading it. I know exactly why I'm here. It's very clear in my mind when I woke up this morning why I'm here to spread my vision and passion to get the old historical breeds of poultry back into the marketplace. When you put your head on your pillow at night, and I encourage you to really wrestle through this, why are you even interested in raising hair and poultry? You may say, I love the birds. That's your mission. May say, I want to preserve a breed that my great grandmother raised. There's your mission. You may say, you know, I want to make money. There's your mission. You may say, I'm sick and tired of what I've seen at Cornish Cross. I think it's critical that you define what you are about. An old McDonald farm, nothing wrong with that mission. A couple chickens, a couple geese, a couple ducks, a couple goats, a couple cows. Old McDonald, I don't, you know, if that's your mission, Go for it. I think it's critical. If your mission is to make money, that's what will drive you. I'm not saying don't make money. Actually, I'm, I'm sick and tired of you losing hundreds and thousands of dollars. You've got to figure out how to, to get rid of that and fix this. All right. But what's your passion? What drives you? Develop a mission statement for your farm. Number two, define your core values. The, Internet, the Center for Poultry, which is kind of the umbrella of the network, we have these four core values. These have never changed for me. Sustainable standard bred poultry, sustainable breeding, small business development and marketing, and my fourth S is successful indigenous farmers. That means I don't want farmers in South Carolina to become dependent upon me. I want them to be successful indigenously and, and, and make it work. So what are your core values? I'll tell you, when, it, when the going gets tough, I'll be really honest with you, this bugs me. People who say, I don't agree with the Cornish cross, I don't agree with the hybrids or the industrialized birds, and they try the heritage, and then they give up because there's so much work I cannot make money at, I'm not willing to put the effort into it, I'm going back to the old birds. My core value will never change. You will never see another Cornish cross or an industrial turkey and God forbid, I pray, that I don't ever give in. Right now, I live by faith. I wait for the next, thank you for your registrations to come. <laughs> but there's times. I just did a few in the last week. I said, Melissa, I'm tired of this. And I go on the internet and find the job positions of Bill Durham's Pride and Tyson. I'm like, I need a regular paycheck. They give me a brand new truck, and I run around and look at industrial chickens. And I think core values are what drive us. I can't go back to the industry as much as I'm like sick and tired of trying to figure out how we're going to make a living at this. I can't do it. And you got to figure out what your core values are. Number three, seek to understand your consumer. When I worked for Diesel, all these inspectors were coming to our farms from Whole Foods, Costco, Sam's Wholesale. And I tell, I tell my, I ask my boss, the guy who kind of taught me everything, Joe, like Joe. Why do we have all these inspections? He said, Jim, the consumer is driving the industry. I said, what do you mean by that? People walk into Whole Foods. Consumers walk into Whole Foods and say, I have some questions about the turkey and the chicken I eat. What'd you feed it? How was it raised? Was it humanely raised? Did it get to see daylight? Did it ever get to eat grass? Did it get to do this? Did it get to do that? Is it organic? What kind of feed did it get? And Whole Foods goes, we don't know. How would we find that out? Well, then Whole Foods says to the consumer, if we start sending our inspectors out, will you then help us pay for those inspectors by paying a higher price for the bird per pound? Well, absolutely. The consumer's driving the industry. So then they hire, they raise the price of the bird, and they send these inspectors out because the consumer's driving the industry. Now, here's what really is frustrating for me. When I get a call, 
Whole Foods are coming to look at the ranches that I supervise. Jim, lock this door, lock this door. Don't take them here, don't show them this, and don't show them this. Trust is a huge issue with a consumer. And I guarantee you, everywhere you live, there are consumers who are asking these kinds of questions. Okay? So, you got to really listen to your, to your customer. All right? What does the consumer want? And this happens all the time. I'm going to write an article. All the misconceptions about organic chicken. It's a joke. Organic turkey. Because if we raised 80,000 toms in a house at Diesel, this was a non-organic building, in an organic building with 8,000 toms, the only difference between the two buildings is no antibiotics, no um, pesticides or spray around the farm, okay? And a certified organic feed that may or may not have GMO in it, okay? They're still in confinement. They're still genetically engineered. They're still growing in pain. There's only this little difference. And so people say, I want organic chicken. I say, wait a minute, what do you really want? Tell me when you hear organic chicken, what are you hearing? I want it to be humanely raised. Stop right there. 99% of the organic chicken is not humanely raised in our country, in the world. Beet trimming, I mean, our turkeys. Let me tell you about beet trimming. They come in, and some, like Whole Foods, can't be trimmed to beets. But we, we grew organic turkeys that had their beets trimmed. We get a, I mean, they're, they're, as they're hatching, they're put into a, a melting thing and melts their beak off. They come to our farms. 8,000 birds ha all hatched yesterday. All have their beaks trimmed. None of them eat and drink for days because they were too hot or wasn't hot enough, and so it crimped their beak. When they don't eat, I'm expected to somehow get this farmer, get those birds eating. Why are you blaming me, the supervisor, or the farmer? That, that's, a, that's a welfare standard. It's ludicrous, but I don't have strong feelings about it. <laughs> <laughs> and so that leads me to number four. You need to know what you're talking about. So when you say, hey, don't raise the Cornish cross, you better have some evidence to back it up. Do your homework. Okay, uh, one of our farmers, um, he said, I'm going to try a few K-22s. So I can, when I say this is why you shouldn't raise these birds, he said, I just need to have, he asked me for permission because we don't allow the hybrids on our certified farms. He said, I, I just, can I try it? I said, that'd be fine. Because I do want your credibility to be able to speak. Now, if you raise Cornish Cross and you try a Buckeye or whatever, then, you know. So number five, sell your story. If you go to dieselturkeyranch.com, they are masters at marketing. And you, you will actually go to the website and go, what was wrong with Jim? Because on the diesel website, you have all these turkeys like ours, bronze, but they're industrialized. They don't actually reproduce, but they sure look at it on the website. And they're all roaming these grass hills in the Sierra foothills. How do you spell that? Well, is, uh, uh, D E I S T E L. It's diesel with a T in it. Diesel Turkey Ranch. Now, what I'm getting at, and it'll say on the website, family farm since 1949. You'll look at the website, and I, I can almost, I mean, I can easily lead you to that website. You probably buy a turkey. That's how good it is. All right? Here's the thing they are masters at selling their story. But about 40,000 turkeys are raised on the home ranch out of the one million. Still today, you can go there as a family and go, we'll take that tom. They banned it, and you come back the next day or a couple days later, and you get your turkey that they process. The other 960,000 are raised in confinement. My key is what I'm telling you is they sell their story, and they're very, very good at it. Look at their website. Number six, networking. A secret. Neighbors, farmers markets, natural stores, organic stores, restaurants, schools, 4-H clubs, rotary, health clubs, co-workers, churches. Let me just, on that networking, these words were carefully uh, thought through. Trust, taste, and tradition. 
if you put our label on your eggs and your chickens, I want those, that networking to be developed through trust. I want our farmers, whether it's uh, our chosen heritage or East of Eden or Jennifer's uh, from the heart farm, okay? First of all, I want part of the trust is Jennifer, when she does this, you have an open door. Come and see the farm. Remember what I told you about biosecurity? There are some precautions that she should take, and I encourage that. But um, to go, you, nobody can come on my farm because you bring you know, your chicken poo poo, all right? So, but you, you start, when, when we start selling turkeys and things start happening, word spreads. Network. You have to develop a plan of action, processing, price, you gotta figure out your price, you're gonna do organic, you're gonna do natural. Um, State and federal laws, okay? I could go off on that, but number eight, careful publicity. Here's what I mean by careful, all right? You can create a website that is 100% fake compared to what real life is on your farm, all right? I see websites and then I see farms and I'm like, you will never be a part of, I mean, husbandry, welfare issues, people that wanted to be in the network. Welfare is one of our core values. And you can see it on this little card here, read about our commitment to welfare. All right? We have farmers who are on Slow Foods websites that you would never want to step foot on. And they're selling birds to Slow Foods USA, Heritage Poultry, and you would never, ever go on a farm. I mean, it's disgusting. And, and um, so all I'm saying is that with publicity, farm, you know, here's something. When you open your farm up and you're exposed, that makes you accountable. Very, very good thing. So I call it careful publicity. Visit, set up, set up at stores and do a little tasting thing. Flyers, brochures. Number nine, which just is a compliment to you, never stop learning and working with others of like-minded vision and passion. And number 10, which... Um, I'll tell you, the longer I'm in this, the more this is a very, very important secret. you got to work hard. <laughs> if you think Rocco and Jim and Todd can do the work and you can kind of ride on the coattails, you know, it, 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 it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of hard work. And uh, so, questions about those, those uh, marketing secrets. Now, in this section, I also put um, I did this handout on how to sell poultry in North Carolina, some of the rules and regulations and phone numbers, some of the North Carolina Department of Agriculture details, uh, safe handling instructions, how to deal with packaging and sewage and water supply and so forth. There's some really, really good information there on the processing side. Okay? So, questions? Comments about marketing or budgeting? Yes. How you doing? Um, what was the question? Ooh, that's, I should have had that figured out today. Uh, we will, uh, it should be done now, but it will be by deposit and we'll let people reserve. I will tell you also, and I forgot about it, you just reminded me. Uh, we're definitely looking to sell some of those. Uh, we have a lot of birds, but I'm going to keep them all. Some of them should not be processed because they're great quality, and so we'll sell some of them as breeders if you're interested in, in having bronze breeders. And stand for that, so. uh, email me, Buck, and say, hey, when can I reserve my turkey? So I should be more organized. Other questions? Uh, yes? Do you know why the uh Department of Agriculture uses the phrase meat and poultry. But meat and poultry? Meat and uh, my guess is they refer to pork and beef as meat and poultry as then just separating them out. That'd be my guess. But they're both, it's all meat. I agree with you. Again, regulations. Oh, explain what you mean. There's a separate rule. I said a rule of poultry versus Oh. And I can completely separate. Yeah, it's the biggest concern. 
Yeah, you really have chicken fleece. Any other questions before I close well, I just want to add that um, he was talking about the insurance thing. Um, we had a friend that had a um, cow farm, and the processor, there's a little bone in the meat. Well, it, the processor didn't get sued, the farmer got sued. So it was a good thing he had a $2 million policy. It always comes back to the farm, yeah. no matter what happens in that cycle. Well, let me, let me tell you this too, it's, a, it's, a, it's so funny for me. I follow the industry very closely. I actually have, still have a foot. I haven't burned any relationships. You know, they, I might burn relationships and if that to a workshop, but at this point, I don't have. But I can go visit Eastall, I walk on, see farmer employees, I go look at birds. I was even sent there to take a few pictures by undercover turkey research. And, uh, but, um, but, uh, where was I going with that? Oh, what I was going to say is, you know, it's really interesting that when you have huge callbacks of salmonella, turkey, or chicken, it is almost 100% coming from high volume industrialized chickens and turkey farms. The welfare issues. When's the last time you read about a small farmer being in prison over a welfare issue? Now, they are out there, and maybe the industry is a little bit more high profile. But um, and you may have heard about that one just within the last year in North Carolina uh, with turkeys. And um, so, anyways, it's about 4:20. Uh, bless you. Thank you so much. If you would fill out the evaluation. Um, also, I have these are different heritage chicken recipes from our chef. Uh, I don't have enough for everyone, but I do have some of these up here, and they're each a different recipe. Um, Take the stuff off the table with you. This article on developing sustainable flocks, I have a bunch of extras up here. If um, I should mention, if you want to join the American Poultry Association, if you sign up today, all right, you can take $5 off. Um, but you can't take it with you. you got to leave it with me because uh, I send it as a bulk uh, uh, on that discount as part of what we put in the budget to the bill to provide that service for you if you're interested, okay? Um, and uh, as far as chicks, poults, anything of that, uh, be sure to look at sustainablepoultrynetwork.com. You'll enjoy the site. Eventually you'll be able to connect with our certified flocks. I'm still working on all that, but uh, I really, uh, it, it's been a, a, a great day and I appreciate you being here. Would you just give Rocco thank you for hosting us? So, you're dismissed, fill out the evaluation, and have a great trip home.